So I'm going to uh, first be talking about the Compact package. But um, so this is, um, this is a talk that was originally developed by a colleague of mine. Uh, and the first thing he, uh, he asks everybody at the beginning is the Wi-Fi working. But, uh, and so I'm borrowing this presentation. But uh, of course, the Wi-Fi is working. This is the Google office. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so obviously, we won't be able to uh, you know, uh, take advantage of the fact that the Wi-Fi is not working. Um, but let's, take, let's imagine some Go code that we're just going like, to talk about that's going to just ping the uh, uh, google.com uh, with an HTTP GET uh, and um, you know, return an error if, if an error happens, and also check the, the status code. Right? You've seen a lot of code that looks like this. Um, but uh, there's a couple of issues with this. Like, say, uh, what happens if Google.com, for some reason, decides that they are going to essentially uh, accept your request and then sleep forever before giving you a response? Uh, in that case, you're going to be kind of uh, left out in the cold, because this is going to just essentially uh, hang forever. Uh, so so uh, you know, we could ping Google like this, but like, Essentially, we want to be able to do something like cancel it in the middle of it. Like, say, I only want to wait maybe five or 10 seconds for the response to come back. And if not, then I want to do something else. Uh, so how would we do that in a Go program? Uh, and the way to do that is to use the context package. Uh, and the context package is a very important package. I believe it was added to the standard library in 1.5. Uh, and before that, it lived as a uh, you know, semi-standard package in the golang org.x you know, uh, directory. Um, but it, this became a, a standard, uh, standard library package. Uh, and actually, it's with 1.7 in 2016. OK, so I got that wrong. Uh, it's actually a lot later than I thought. Um, but it's essentially a th about 370 lines without comments. It's fairly, uh, you know, simple package. Um, but it's, uh, it's extremely, extremely important. And inside of that, it only exposes like one interface uh, and uh, several functions. So the, first, the most important is the actual context interface. Uh, and this context interface is what you'll be using. Uh, and kind of objects that implement this interface are things that you'll be passing around and, and using most of the time. So the context interface looks something like this. You'll have an object that has all these like, kind of methods on it, the done uh, you know, deadline and value and error. Uh, and we'll kind of see how to use these as we go, and go along. Uh, the, the done method essentially gives you a, a way of checking to see that a particular context is done. Um, and you know, to tell you, kind of take a step back and explain what a context is, and a context is essentially a, uh, a context or, or, a, or a wrapper that you can use to uh, say, when you get a request or you're handling a sort of request, you can uh, tell whether that request is done or uh, to kind of attach values to that context that get passed along to lots of different components within the system. And we'll kind of see how that works uh, in practice a little bit later. I think that it's easier instead of explaining what it is to actually see what it, how you use it. Uh, so it also has this error method to, in case you know, uh, timeouts and things like that uh, happen uh, to get the actual error. Uh, and these types of uh, deadlines down here, or these errors down here, these are actually, uh, uh, I think, context types or actually error, different types of error within, uh, within context that you can receive. So how do we actually cancel the ping that when we, when we did the, uh, when we pinged uh, google.com? Uh, so if you aren't going to change the interface itself, you can uh, do the ping Google inside of a Go routine uh, and then pass the error that comes back to a, a channel, uh, an error channel, uh, and then essentially select on that error channel. So you could say, whenever that ping is done, uh, then you know, return that error, or wait uh, if the context, check if the context is done, and if the context is done, uh, then return the context's error. And then we can use the context to, do, to set things like timeouts and whatnot. So here we're doing this kind of, we're kind of wrapping our ping Google function. 
uh, with this ping Google with context function. And then we can give it a context uh, that can then uh, do things like handle timeouts and whatnot. And so how, how you set the context and how you actually create this context value is what's kind of important for how it handles that. So let's talk about how to create context values themselves. So the context package exposes a number of functions that you can use to get context values. Uh, the first one is the, the one that you can use, that you use pretty often is the background. Uh, and this essentially returns the background context. Uh, so you can imagine that you might have an application that, uh, that uh, will accept a request and then make several requests in the back end. Uh, so maybe you need to ping you know, one, one application server and another application server and another application server and then kind of aggregate the responses back. So you, maybe you're a web server that has to ping several other microservices within uh, your architecture. And you can do that like, you know, uh, asynchronously, say, uh, and then aggregate the responses back. But if any one of those takes too long, then your whole request will take too long. Uh, or if, say, the client, you know, times out, then you want to cancel all of the, 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 uh, the, the requests that you've done. So you can essentially take that context and pass it throughout your application to kind of uh, and ex create a different context or create a type of tree structure that will then allow you to, um, uh, to manage each of the different parts of the, uh, the uh, dependent uh, requests. So say like if, individual, uh, if one individual request times out then, or is, becomes done, then all of the parent ones that, uh, of that request uh, will then, or that are dependent on it, will then actually become done as well. And so you can cancel the whole entire request out to the client. Uh, and the reason why we call it the background context is because this is essentially the root of that tree. Uh, so, and this is actually a, uh, when you call this background, it returns you a single uh, instance that is essentially a global context that's used uh, inside of your Go program. Uh, Another one that's of note is the to-do one, which is essentially the same thing as background, except for the fact that this is essentially labeling the fact that you, are, you don't know what you're doing uh, or you don't know what, what context to use in that particular uh, scenario. Uh, so you can go back and kind of check that later uh, to actually kind of make sure that you're passing context around properly. So the easiest way to do this is to like get a context background and pass, pass it to the ping with context. Um, but this essentially doesn't really do anything. Uh, there's no timeouts or anything like that associated with this. So this is just going to uh, give us a kind of background uh, or blank context. Uh, the same thing with to do. Uh, so what we want to do is be able to say, like, either cancel it partway through. Uh, and so in this case, what we're going to do is kind of cancel it instead of, like, setting a timeout. We're going to just say, uh, you know, add the with cancel uh, wrapper to this. So if we call with cancel, this is going to give us another context, but also significantly it's going to give us this little cancel. Um, and this cancel is actually a function that we, can use, that we can call to cancel our context. So if we do this, uh, we can say uh, with time after func, you know, pass one second, call cancel. And so after one second, we're actually going to cancel our context. So if Google doesn't respond within one second, we're actually going to cancel the context and return out of here. And we'll end up getting this uh, could not ping Google error. Actually, we will get a, if we look back at the code, we will get a, this context error. Uh, and we'll actually see that as could not ping Google. And then it will say, like, context canceled or something similar like that. So another thing that you can use is to, you can set timeouts, which essentially do the same thing as we did here, which is uh, after a, a second or two, we'll call cancel. And uh, here, what we're going to do is call the with timeout function, which gives us just where you pass the context and a deadline, a timeout. Uh, and then with uh, the final thing that you can do with context is actually pass a value to them. Uh, and this is, these can be used uh, as kind of a, uh, you know, maybe a request global type of, uh, you know, key value store that you can use uh, throughout the application. I'm not going to really talk about this too much, but uh, you can essentially uh, add some keys 
and values to a particular context uh, and then use that throughout your request. So like say you want to set a request ID and then log uh, the request ID throughout the application, you can use something like that here. So these context values, as I'm doing this, I mentioned that it caused, creates this key structure. Uh, so when you call background, it creates, it creates this background, or it uses this background context, which is a global uh, root context. And then when we call with cancel or with value uh, uh, from the context package, it's actually gonna create us a new context that uh, does a, um, that creates a, um, a sub, Subcontext uh, that is a a uh, what is it a child of the the background context and then it as we do this it creates uh, new and uh, newer contexts uh, to form a kind of tree so you can kind of create call on the uh, the value the value that got returned from with cancel you can actually call things like with deadline or with value on those as well and it forms this kind of tree structure. So if any one of these, like say this one that was returned by with value at the bottom here, uh, becomes finishes, then all of those uh, contexts above it will then uh, continue, it will kind of propagate throughout the, the system back to the, uh, to the original context. So let's kind of go back. Um, so the deadline exceeded error is, is one of the errors within context that uh, can kind of get used uh, to that you can kind of check when uh, these uh, when you use the uh, this with deadline, uh, and there's also a canceled uh, error as well that you can check for. So this is another. Uh, so this is so when you get these sign of errors back from your context, uh, this is something that you should actually kind of handle these type of errors uh, gracefully. Uh, not just, or don't just check them, you actually have to handle them. Uh, and this is actually written by, was uh, said by uh, somebody who I believe is in the audience. Uh, he kind of looks like this, <laughs> vaguely. Uh, but yeah, he's, this is actually a really, really good uh, uh, thing to say or a thing to, to follow in that you really want to be able to handle things uh, like, uh, handling timeouts and handling these type of things gracefully. But what happens a lot of times is that folks don't actually use the context package and so they don't even know that these errors, it's not like an error gets passed back to them. It's a, that they're not even uh, kind of handling something or they're not even understanding that there could be an error to begin with. So, and that's, that's the case with things like deadlines and timeouts. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of skip over these a little bit, but essentially what you can kind of do with the, uh, the cancel is um, you can do things like uh, actually cancel it later. Um, but I think what I'm gonna do is actually kind of go through and show you a little bit about um, how to actually use the package itself uh, and what that looks like kind of in practice, right? So here I've got a kind of application that uh, is going to do, to basically wait for a certain number of seconds and then it's going to print a message, right? This is a very simple application. Uh, and so here I have kind of a main method that where I'm doing, getting this context uh, and then I'm going to uh, wrap that another, uh, with another context here with this with timeout uh, and give it, you know, this four seconds. Uh, so this is kind of how we did this with the, or how I, um, show that you can use the, the context package. Um, but this, this will actually show you how within your applications you can actually receive a context and then kind of actually make use of it. So here, the, the naive way to do it would be to do something like time sleep. Uh, I think you could just take the duration here and then you would just say log.print, uh, you know, what's our message here, msg, right? And if we do something like just run this, uh, go run, start at go, it'll essentially wait for three seconds and then print our message hello, right? Uh, and if we said that this timeout was two seconds, uh, we, would, we might expect that, that we would actually timeout, but that's actually not the case. We're actually going to 
uh, just we're actually going to wait the three seconds and then print our message. Uh, so why is that? The reason why is because we have to actually check that to make sure that the context is done. And we'll do that using the select, uh, using select um, to kind of check the, uh, the, um, the, done, the done channel on the context, uh, as well as checking when, uh, at, like, uh, we'll check the, a timer that we'll set for the, uh, the original three seconds. So the first thing we'll do is handle the base case, which is uh, to check time after our, dura our regular duration. And then we'll just say uh, log print uh, message. And then our other case, which is to check if the context is done, we'll actually check the context channel, tx.done. And then we'll just say, uh, actually, this doesn't return an error. So we'll just log that here as well. Print f. And we'll just say percent %v. Uh, ctx.err, like this, right? So this should actually check to uh, check our context so that when we, if the, the context actually uh, times out, then it will return a, a value on this context done channel and it'll actually uh, drop out here and print the, the error that came back from the context. So you might expect as well that if we extend this deadline here, that it will actually uh, run through to completion and print our hello message. So that's great. Uh, that's really interesting. But uh, the real power what comes when you have like things like uh, client type of applications, client server type of applications. So I'm going to drop out to a client app. And what this is going to do is just kind of ping our, uh, do a request to a local host. Uh, and so what we're going to do here is create a context that we're going to um, send to our web server uh, that's going to actually, uh, that's going to wait, set a timeout for our, for our web server. So we'll say ctx tx equals context background. Then we'll actually set a context cancel equals context with timeout stx and then we'll set this to say like three seconds and then we'll uh, defer the cancel so the cancel actually deferring cancel and running cancel uh, here is important because uh, this actually sets up some timer or use it sets up some resources using uh, to to run the timer, and so we need to actually cancel that so that make sure that those are freed. And then we're going to uh, set the request uh, uh, for our HTTP server to request.withcontext, I believe, is the right incantation. So here we've created a, a, an HTTP request, and then we've created our context, and we're setting it there. Uh, with context, this should be request, and I think CTX. Let me, if I remember right here, it's going to complain about this a little bit. Call to with context, HTTP request context. Uh, I think it was that. Yeah, that's right because this is actually a method. Uh, okay, yeah, so it's, this is actually uh, compiling now. So then we'll actually go jump over to our server app. Uh, and we'll uh, implement essentially the same sort of application, but we're going to like uh, return our hello message uh, from the web server. So here we can say, uh, we'll have this sleep and talk, and we'll say select uh, on this and run this guy again, essentially, after time, oops, time dot after uh, D. Um, then we'll say, uh, take this writer and then write a, gosh, uh, 
I had this as a string. So a message e, and then this is a case, uh, ctx.done, and then return. Uh, this is actually not returning an error, but let's see, just log the error message. Uh, printf. Right. So with our application here, we should uh, we're going to pass it the the response writer for our for our HTTP server, so that it will write to the client, uh, and then we'll have this we'll have it wait for five seconds before returning hello to the client. Right. And I'm going to jump out here and actually run this and just allow that. Oops. And then if we jump back over to our client, we should see that we have a timeout here of three seconds. So we can expect that our uh, client will actually time out this time. OK, so the client deadline exceeded uh, is the error message that we got out here. Because we're actually, the client times out after three seconds, but our server is is actually waiting five seconds before, print, uh, before printing the message. Uh, so our server is taking actually five seconds to return a message. So we can kind of extend this to actually make it work. Um, but, uh, or we can go back to our server side uh, application and go to the five seconds here and make this two instead. And then if we do that, uh, then our client app Ugh. should actually return the hello message, right? So, so this is a great way to, like, from the client's perspective as well as the service perspective. So, like, if the client makes a request to a server that's going to take a long time, you want to be able to set timeouts so that you're going to actually be able to, like, not wait forever. Uh, and on the server side as well, you don't want to wait for clients uh, to, to send their, their, uh, their requests um, uh, forever, right? You, the, ser the server wants to time out as well. Uh, and so it's essential that you actually set these timeouts, uh, but this is actually something that a lot of people don't do. So who, are, who, actually, who actually writes API servers or, or writes web servers in Go uh, actually is, is checking uh, this sort of context and setting timeouts? So what, let's, let's raise your hand. How many people are actually writing API servers or web servers in Go? Just all together. OK. And then how many people are actually using context to check timeouts? I, I saw Dave Cheney actually lower his hand here. So even Dave Cheney doesn't even do this. <laughs> <laughs> so but one of the, one of the actual, um, you know, you can imagine that this sort of thing is really powerful for things like client libraries uh, that, makes, that connect to uh, web servers and that sort of thing, uh, and connect to, uh, to cloud APIs or whatnot. And so uh, one of the, the uh, libraries that actually makes uh, kind of judicious use of the context package and makes sure that uh, it, you can set timeouts and you can pass context properly uh, is the, uh, the libraries from the, uh, the, Go cloud, the Google Cloud Platform uh, the API libraries in Go for Google Cloud Platform. So uh, I'm going to kind of switch over here and have uh, uh, Shilin talk a little bit about the uh, about GCP and the uh, client libraries in Go. Do you have the uh, yeah mic? Have to All right. This one. All right. Hello. All right, thanks, thanks again for sharing this because using context is very important if you do API, otherwise your thousands of the Go routines will be blocked by uh, bogus clients or not responsive server. Thanks a while. So uh, today I'm going to share a little bit more about uh, Go microservice support whatever API app support on the cloud. Um, of course, I work for Google. I'm a strategic customer engineer, so I know other cloud providers provide relatively good Go support, but I'm going to focus on Google only. 
All right. When talking about Go support in cloud, we really mean uh, two things actually. One, how do you run your Go apps on cloud? Uh, in this case, especially we are talking about GCP. The other one is how Go is well supported as a client API language on Google Cloud. I have uh, prepared a short demo to show you how do you use Kubernetes. Thanks for Matthew from DigitalOcean sharing Kubernetes. I'm going to show that in real action. Uh, how do you run a banking application, a core banking application on Kubernetes and Spanner? So Go, as you know, is a run once. Doesn't run everywhere, but you have to compare, compile for every platform. It runs everywhere. Yeah, some famous guy I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of Google so Google Cloud Go app support, um, there are many many ways to run Go apps, as um, as you know. So, Google Cloud offers virtual machine. Obvi obviously, you can compile your Go into binary and create a system D in this script, whatever, deploy it to a virtual machine, you'll be good to go, right? Alternatively, you can run in instance groups, you can create a Docker container, mount it to Google Cloud instance group, auto scales as, as a CPU resource use, you can monitor by QPS, as well and so forth. You can also run Google App Engine Flags, which is a new feature we just released, uh, general availability. You can create a Docker version, a Docker image, and deploy to Google Cloud, specify how do you want to run your application with what kind of scale. The last one we offer is actually Kubernetes. Kubernetes, as you know, is open source distributed scheduler for Docker containers. So there are some good and bad about all this. So virtual machine is very simple, but it's, it's very difficult to manage. Instance group is a sli sli slightly better, uh, yet it's still proprietary and uh, you need DevOps to support that. AppNG Flex is a full zero ops support, and you can really scale to almost unlimited scale. Uh, as you probably know, Snapchat runs on AppNG. But it's still preferred if you prefer not to be locked in, then uh, Kubernetes is one of your best options uh, available on Google Cloud. In terms of API support, I have to assure you, Golang is the first class citizen of uh, Google Cloud client language. If you look at all the APIs we provide, almost all the major products we have Golang API support. If we don't, it's, it's a very, very rare case, but you still can go through the HTTP API level by using your own uh, Go programming language. I just take some snippets for, for that. For example, if you want to use Google Cloud Storage, which is uh, Amazon S3 equivalent, you really need to get the context and create new client and uh, refer to a bucket and object, then you define a reader, then you start reading the objects. It's as simple as that. If you want to write object, you just need to change here and uh, change this to a new writer. Then you can start writing to the object. It's, uh, in a few lines of code, you can start writing and reading from uh, Google Cloud Storage. The other one example is the Google Cloud Big Table. This is our managed HBase version, right? With this example, you really can open the client in a few lines of code and do start scanning by prefix. And you can map the rows to a function and iterate through the rows uh, in a few lines as well. Another example will be data store. So this, I'm not going to go through the details, but it's sim somewhat similar. You just need to create a client and start writing entities and uh, you, are, you are good to go. The last one is Spanner. Spanner is our new distributed, strong, consistent, new SQL database. So uh, Spanner is no, nothing fancy here. You, you just create a client, issue SQL statement with binding a parameter to a certain value. You run it, you get results back and go in a few lines of code. And all of this code, you can e e easily copy and paste to a Go and start running in like 10 seconds or so. So here, I have, a, I have a short demo for you. I'm going to show you the code. Uh, then I'm going to show you how do you deploy this, run in Kubernetes, how do you scale this application. So I have pre-created a spanner table on Google Cloud. It's very simple, it's running in Taiwan data center. I create, this demo is for a core banking application. Imagine 
you are doing a banking application, uh, supports a few transactions like open accounts, deposit money to the account, uh, debit money from the account, and transfer money from account A to account B. That's all I want to do today. So I have two tables. One is the account table, it's very, very simple. I have account number and balance. And I have a transaction table, which has uh, what's the transaction ID, and when did it happen, and what's the transaction about, and who is the account involved, what's the amount involved, was it successful or not, right? That's a really simple schema. You can actually look at the, the table, and you can look at the DDL. You can see it's created using standard SQL, uh, using create table syntax, all right? Then I have a pre-created uh, container engine. So if you don't know, in order to create a Kubernetes cluster, you don't have to spend five DevOps hours or DevOps days to do it. You just go to Google Cloud and create cluster and specify where, how much CPU, how much RAM you need. Then in a few minutes, you have a cluster running on cloud. I have, the, I have this container cluster created here. As you can see, I have a, a, uh, 36 vCPU and 135 GB of RAM. So you can easily scale up, scale down easily. I just pre-created this for the demo purpose. Looking at the code. Oh, shit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looking at the code, I, I, really, I really have a, a transaction manager here. And everything else is basically RPC wrapping code, basically make it available through gRPC uh, running on the cloud. So I'm going to talk about the TR, T, transaction manager uh, a little bit only. So I have a, a table, I have a few operations like uh, open accounts, supported, uh, debit, credit, uh, get a reading account information, and transfer. So I'm going to skip all the rest. I've spent like one minute here explaining uh, Spanner. Oh, and the context API is in there. Yeah, context API is here. Yeah, that's very important. <laughs> So, uh, so in Spanner, doing, doing the transaction, you, you, probably, you probably know in, in, cloud, in JDBC, you just start a transaction, set auto commit to false, do whatever you want to do, then commit. In Spanner, you batch the operation together, you run it, it's all, in, all success or all fail. So we are managing transaction for you. So what I did here is really uh, read account balance of account one and read, account, read the balance of account two, right? Then I add the balance to account two and debit from one. And if that account one goes negative, yeah. I can, I can make it bigger, unfortunately. I think this is the resolution <laughs> issue, but I hope you can see it clearly. <laughs> Sorry. So um, it's very simple. It's a very simple JDBC logic. You, you get balance of two accounts, add to the second account, and do something about it, and save it together. So I have, a, I have a demo banking application as a standalone. I'm just going to run this here to show you works. OK. OK, this is banking CLI. I'm going to uh, open account 8888, OK? Opened, account opened. OK, I read this account, how much money I have. Of course, it's zero, right? I have already pre-opened uh, one account. Okay, I want to have uh, one one seven three dollars. I transfer to eight 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 seven dollars. Okay, I transfer successfully. I read eight 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 eight. What's the value? It's seven, right? I read one one one. It's one six six. So it works as advertised, right? How do I run it in cloud right now? So. I have to go to the cloud console. I already have a, a, a machine running in cloud. So uh, I'm going to SSH in there and show you how do we deploy it to cloud and how simple it is. It is. Do we have Wi-Fi? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to build and deploy. I, for simplicity, I've already do, have done this in a single shell script. I probably have to use a, a line work, a workflow, but maybe later. Um, so I export the Go path. I basically compile the, the source code, right? I copy the Docker file to the binary folder and start building there using the Docker build. And then I tag it and the cloud, I push it to Google Cloud as a, one version of the, of the code. So I'm going to build it. You finish in, in seconds because the code hasn't been changed yet. 
Oh, someone changed it. <laughs> okay, build, push into Google Cloud. It's done. Okay, so in seconds, I, I push this code to, uh, to Google Cloud. Now, I want to push to the Kubernetes cluster, I want to run five copy of them. Kubernetes will take care of the scheduling. That means if my code has bug, I crashed after three days, Kubernetes will start one immediately in many seconds. So in Kubernetes, I really create a replication controller. So I really, really, what does it do is really says, okay, I have a replication controller. This can make sure I have a certain number of replica running on the cloud. The number of replica is five. The name of the replica is starting with banking RPC and it has some labels there. And the most importantly, the image, image here is actually the image I deployed just now. So with this, I can use kubectl to deploy to cloud. Yeah, guess what? It's running five copies. Now if you're not happy, I only run 10 copies because I can need to scale. In a few minutes, or in a few seconds, you can see 10 copies are running. One still creating, but do it again. You'll see they are all running. They are wired behind load balancer. I have pre-created because load balancer takes like a few minutes. Okay, now I'm going to run the demo on, 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 on testing this thing out. I'm going to use uh, 10 threads, a uh, fast threads to run 10 transactions on, on this server. Then I'm going to use 500 threads, run 100,000 uh, transactions. Four seconds, all right? That's about um, a little bit close to 3,000 QPS. And with 3,000 QPS, you probably can handle 260 million transactions per day. And that's probably good enough for China. And you only spend $500 a month on this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. question. We don't hold you back for lunch, but if you have any question, I'm happy to, we are happy to hear to answer. I guess everyone's hungry. Uh, we're not prepared. Yeah, let's answer questions. Um, question. Um, can we forget lunch? Yeah, let's just go to lunch. Yes, so we have lunch outside.